Zach is back. It's the Zach Gelb Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. Welcome back, Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, The Jersey, 609-919-9200 is the number if you want to hop on board with us. Time in the Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios is 516. Let's go out to the hotline right now and welcome in a very fine writer for the New York Daily News. Does a tremendous job covering football, and he's done it for a very long time, and that's Gary Myers who joins the Zach Gelb Show. Gary, how are you? I'm doing great, Zach. How you doing? Well, I'm doing great, and I appreciate a few minutes. So I'm not a big political guy, but I will watch these uh, conventions. And last night, uh, you had Melania Trump basically just going out there and steal some of Michelle Obama's uh, speech back in 2008. Uh, I'm sure that you've had to uh, possibly learn about plagiarism in your time, and you know that is something you don't do. And I saw you writing about the Flategate um, a few uh, days ago. Would you be okay if maybe I took a paragraph or two and uh, – use it next time i write something uh zach for you anything feel free (laughs) feel free how how ridiculous is that especially in our age of social media how how does someone go on out there and think they could just take someone's speech and i didn't know she wasn't the one that did it it was someone that wrote her speech Uh, but i was just laughing last night when i was seeing that stuff on twitter it it almost reads like you know someone was trying to sabotage her because the, the words were i mean it wasn't even paraphrasing the words were identical and um, I, I was just reading a comparison, you know, about 20 minutes ago, I was just reading about a, a comparison, you know, putting the speeches side by side. And, I mean, my goodness, uh, someone really uh, messed her up with that because you'd have to say you think, you know, she, she didn't do that herself. But um, wh- whoever would just it, – it's inexplicable. It's inex- that's all I got to say. It's uh, inexplicable. There's no doubt about that. And uh, it's laughable that there are some journalists out there that are defending it today because, if, like I said, if I took some of their paragraphs, uh, they wouldn't be too happy with me and they would probably put me on blast. But let's get to some football talk because that's what we do best. Uh, we'll put the politics on the back burner. And I think you'll like that, and I would as well. Muhammad Wilkerson, going back to last week, got the deal done. Uh, Gary, I was very surprised that that deal came about. In fact, there was no indication up until the Jets announcing on Friday that anything was going on. Uh, the Jets have been pretty adamant for the last year or so that they were not interested in doing a long-term deal. They had made it well-known around the league that they were willing to trade him. And now I think they wound up doing the right thing because he was their best defensive player last year. And if you put him side by side with Sheldon Richardson, you might say that potentially Richardson could be better, but he's got off-the-field issues, and Wilkerson, you know, has been a model citizen in his five years with the Jets. So uh, I I think they invested in the sure thing, and, you know, maybe they'll wind up signing Wilkerson, I mean, uh, Richardson as well in a couple of years when his deal is up. But um, I'm a firm believer that you just have to sign your best players. You have to find a way to bring them back. Um, You can – Maneuver and manipulate the salary cap any way you want to fit your purposes. You can always restructure, renegotiate anything you want to do to create the, the cap room for players that you really want to keep. And there was really no good reason that they weren't interested in having Wilkerson here long, long term. I'm not exactly sure, you know, what caused their change in thinking because uh, the Jets have not publicly addressed this as of yet. Uh, I, at the very least, they just came to their senses and, and kept a very good player uh, on their roster. And I know Muhammad being a Temple guy, and he wanted to stay with the Jets uh, growing up in New Jersey and then playing his college ball in Philadelphia at Temple. And uh, there's a Temple connection there with Todd Bowles being the head coach. So it's good to see that deal get done. So one deal is done. The other is Ryan Fitzpatrick. That deal is not done, and training camp is approaching. Do the Jets get a deal done with Ryan Fitzpatrick by the start of the season? Well, it, it would be hard to believe um, that they wouldn't sign him. He's got nowhere to go, and they have no alternative but to start Geno Smith if he's not, if Ryan doesn't sign. And, and Geno Smith is really Fitzpatrick's best leverage because I guarantee you the Jet coaches do not want uh, Geno to start. I really thought that after the first couple of weeks of free agency and – and it became clear, you know, that Denver wasn't interested in, in San Francisco and 
you know, maybe all the couple teams that we were speculating about that might have been landing spots for Fitzpatrick, and when they didn't step up and make him a, an offer or really show any interest, it became clear that, the you know, Fitz's best option was to return to the Jets, and he was clearly the best choice, you know, to be the Jets quarterback this year. And then um, after they drafted Christian Hackenberg, um, I think that the plan is that they would like to uh, bring Hackenberg along slowly but have him ready to play next year. The, the Jets of Orford fits a fair deal for 2016, $12 million, but then in the next two years it goes down to six. So it's a three-year, $24 million deal. He's happy with the first-year money, not happy uh, with the money they've offered in the second and third year. So how far apart do you think those sides really are? Because you, you just had the numbers that you you, you offered to us, and mm -hmm. hey, heck, Ryan Fitzpatrick, he is an all-time great quarterback to say the least. He has problems having consistent seasons. So how far are these two sides really that far off? Well, Zach, I think that if the Jets were to cut down their offer to a one-year, twelve million dollar deal, or even add you know a phony second year onto it. Um, you know, for $22 million, that an option year that you know the Jets would would refuse to pick up, and the purpose of that would be to cut the salary cap charge in half this year uh, to $6 million. I think he, I mean, I know he would take a one-year, $12 million deal. Uh, the Jets just don't feel they want to pay that much for one year, and then he can walk. If, you know, and if he has a good year, they'd want to bring him back as a starter. So the Jets are trying to protect their interests by. Having a second and third year, but the, the dollar figures, uh, I mean, I've never really heard of this, where you cut the guy's money in half in, in the second year. Uh, I'm sure there's some incentives in there that would allow him to build it back up, but um, to me, the best alternative is to find a way to bring him back short term and, um, and then just see what happens this year. Do McKagan and, and Bowles, do they set a date and say, hey, Ryan, you need to get a deal done. We need to get a deal done by this date or we just move on? Because eventually uh, the Jets, they're going to have to – I know they don't want to go with Geno Smith, but you can't let this thing go that far into training camp. He's the quarterback of the team. And that's right. And um, you just have to remember, I don't think missing the, the, um, the offseason stuff really means anything. If you remember when the Jets – traded for him last year. He came here with a broken leg that he suffered late in the season in Houston and, and missed all the offseason stuff for the most part. So what he's missed up to this part, up to this point rather, is less damaging than missing last year because at least now he knows the offense and he's uh, reached a level of comfort with uh, Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. But that being said, you just can't have this stretch over the course of training camp like it did with Darrell Revis in 2010. It, it, the quarterback of the team uh, is just treated differently. I, I still think that he'll get signed within a day or two of training camp and at the very least within the first week of camp. At some point, like you mentioned, Zach, at some point they're going to have to say, you know what, we're just moving on. It's not like they're waiting for Dan Marino or Tom Brady or, you know, Name you know, pick any name of that uh, caliber to come back. We're still talking about Ryan Fitzpatrick, a guy who threw away the playoffs in the fourth quarter of the last game of the year with three interceptions, costing himself millions. Um, the, the Jets are going to have a breaking point on this. I'm not exactly sure what it is at this point. I'm not sure they know what it is right now, but I don't see this stretching you know, deep into training camp where he shows up before the third preseason game and it's handed the starting job. At some point, they're going to say, you know what, see you later. We're talking to Gary Myers, who joins us from the New York Daily News. All right, let's go to a little Eagles. Carson Wentz, uh, there's been a lot talking about him this week, and there's going to be a lot of hype all throughout the season. It sounds like you're not going to see that much of Carson Wentz, but from the things that you've been able to watch of him, do you think the Eagles have the real deal in one Carson Wentz? I honestly don't know. I mean, he played at a small school, a low level of competition. I know he's very, very highly thought of, not just by the Eagles, but by a bunch of teams. But it's a 50-50 deal with a lot of these first-round quarterbacks. And especially when it goes 1-2, there's been a, a history now of one guy makes it and one doesn't, you know, over the last 20 years when they go 1-2 like this. Um, 
I, I can't I can't tell you how he's going to do at the next level. I mean, he seems to have a lot of the intangibles that teams are looking for. He's a bright guy, catches on quick, um, has a good arm, but he played at a, at a lesser level of competition. Not that that's you know the deciding factor because there's been plenty of quarterbacks in the NFL who have done very well who have not played at a major college. But uh, to sit here and say in in July before he even goes to his first training camp that the Eagles have a sure thing, I think that that would be a stretch. And I'd say the same thing about Jared Goff, that you know the Rams certainly gave up a lot to get him, but do they know for sure that they have a potential oh, – not a potential, they think they have a potential Pro Bowl player, but do they know for sure that they have a Pro Bowl player? No. I mean, you just don't know about these guys. Every team has a different approach, but as of recent memory, you see a lot of teams playing these rookie quarterbacks right away. You saw what Robert Griffin III was able to do in his first year. Andrew Luck, uh, last year, uh, Mariota and Jameis Winston. And I was reading something on Philly Voice that said the other day that uh, Doug Peterson said when he was talking about Carson Wentz that right now he would be inactive on game day because he is the third quarterback. And you know how the NFL works, the third quarterback. Mm-hmm quarterback is usually inactive is that the right approach to go about it with Carson Wentz in your opinion to make him inactive for the early part of the season well they have so much money invested in Sam Bradford that um it gives them I don't want to say the luxury because if they had to do it over again they never would have signed Bradford if they knew they were going to get Wentz but having all that money invested in Bradford he has to open the season as the starter and so if you could do it like that, and then he also paid a bunch of money to Chase Daniel to come in and be the backup, um, it, it doesn't hurt to go back to the old way of doing things, and, and that's to let a guy you know, sit and watch for a while. And Donovan McNabb did that in 99, uh, and Doug Peterson, you know, ironically yeah. enough, was the, was the starter for the Eagles um, through at least the first half of the 99 season, maybe even a little bit more than that until McNabb was ready. So that's the way it always was done, that a a rookie quarterback almost never played in his first year or never got significant playing time. That's all changed. A lot of that had to do with the money. Um, There was so much money invested in these quarterbacks at the top of the first round that owners were almost demanding that they get on the field right away. But with the CBA that was signed in 2011 and the rookie money came way down, you can financially afford to let a guy sit and watch for a little bit. And I still think that's probably the ideal way of doing it by not making him start, you know, from the get-go. But there's been, you know, success and failure stories, you know, both ways. So uh, each case is individual. I'm sure that, you know, Peterson will pick the right spot to put Wentz in. Living in Philadelphia for the last four years, I could tell you this. I know how this is going to work out. Every time when Sam Bradford throws an interception or has an incomplete pass, the fans, especially if the Eagles are going through a rough season, are going to be booing and they're going to be chanting, we want Wentz. So with that being said, and I know that the the uh, the, the general manager and the coach aren't going to always make the moves in the best interest of the fans, but I'm curious. So we had this as our poll question yesterday, so I'll ask it to you today does Carson Wentz play over under two and a half regular season games this year for the Eagles so are are you positioning that any any two and a half games or starting say two games let's go starting two and a half games all right so in your scenario um Zach would say okay maybe he comes in in the second half of the 13th 14th game of the season and then starts 15th and 16th game, that's probably how it would work out if you're saying two and a half. I would say um, there's a very good chance that happening because I don't think the Eagles are going to be challenging for a playoff spot. And at that point in the year, um, it's better to get the guy some experience that the playoffs are not on the line. If you intend to start him in 2017, which I'm sure the Eagles, that's, that's their game plan right now, so it's, it's better to let him get some game action in towards the end of this year so that you're not starting from scratch, basically, um, and getting him his first game action in, in the season opener in 17. You know, let, let him see the um, see defenses at, at full speed and 
And uh, it's so much different than college, obviously. And I've been so much different than the preseason and, and anything I'll see in practice. If the Eagles are out of it, then I'd say two and a half games, I would take the over on that. Okay, fair enough, as Gary Myers joins us from the New York Daily News. By the way, you were talking about the NFC East. Uh, I, I agree. I don't think the Eagles are going to be that good, but you look at the NFC East, I don't know who the favorite is right now. If you had to rank the NFC East uh, from one to four, how would you rank that right now uh, before we start training camp? Well, is that the last thing I am is provincial. <laughs> but I, I would say right now I, I, I put the Giants at the top because they have the best quarterback in the division, and – uh, although I'm not 100% convinced that spending all this money on the defense is going to work because there's been so Agreed. many examples in the NFL that, uh, you know, it's not like a baseball team where you just plug guys into positions and they play. Uh, it, it requires so much more than that. But the Giants lost at least five games, I think, when they had the lead in the last two minutes last year, So if they, and they couldn't make any defensive stops. So if the defense has improved with, with the signings that they've made, and Eli continues to really thrive in uh, Ben McAdoo's offense, then I would put the Giants first, probably um, the Cowboys second. I don't believe in the Redskins. Uh, Redskins third and, and the Eagles probably fourth. But um, it's not like I'm saying the Eagles are going to finish six games behind. I think, you know, once again, this is going to be one of the weaker divisions um, in the NFL, and 10 games could easily win it. And when you take a look at the Giants, the defense, you do expect it to get better, and hopefully that could at least help them out closing out football games this year. But uh, but another key for them has to be their offensive line, especially that right side. When you take a look at that Giants offensive line, and I know there's going to be some battles in camp, but how do you evaluate uh, that offensive line unit going into the season? Well, you know, they spent a lot of high draft picks on um... – uh, an offensive lineman recently, you know, Eric Flowers was a one, Justin Pugh was a one, uh, Weston Ritzburg, the center is a two, but the right side of the line, you know, is shaky, and um, it's definitely it's definitely the weak spot. And, um, you know, they have Marshall Newhouse at right tackle, which is not an ideal situation by any means. Uh, I would say that is the number one problem spot uh, going into training camp. There, there could be some players that become available in the early part of camp, but usually um, what to go with into camp unless you have an injury is pretty much uh, the team they get taken to the season. So, uh, you know, the Giants are going to have to hope that the right, you know, John Jerry is a right guard. Um, they got to have to hope that the, that the right side of the offensive line, you know, holds up. Um, Eli is savvy enough to buy a little time stepping up in the pocket, but um, like most quarterbacks, he doesn't like to get hit. And uh, if they can't protect him, the Giants are in trouble. Wrap it up with Gary Myers, who joins us right now on the Zach Gelb Show. So I read what you had to say about the ultimate payback for Deflategate would be Tom Brady having to receive another Lombardi trophy and a Super Bowl MVP from Roger Goodell. I agree with you, and I uh, know just watching Tom Brady for his entire career and talking to a lot of former Brady teammates, he's going to be as motivated as ever. But Brady tried to fight this thing as long as possible. He could have taken it to the Supreme Court. Were you surprised that he personally did not go that route and elect to uh, sit out the four games? Well, I think when his um, options were put on the table for him um, last week after the Second Circuit Court of Appeals elected not to grant him a rehearing, um, the situation became, you know, petitioning uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg to issue a stay, you know, from the Supreme Court, uh, which I think he had a good chance to get. And then they had until October 13th to ask the Supreme Court to actually hear the case. The problem for Brady, and it came, this is why uh, he dropped the request for the stay, is that say he got the stay and it took him through, allowed him to play up until the point that the Supreme Court ruled whether they would hear the case or not. There was no set time that the Supreme Court would make that ruling. It could have happened in November, December, January, February, March, maybe as late as next May. But if it happened in November or December or even January, and they said, okay, we're not going to hear the case, the stay automatically gets removed, 
and the suspension would have started immediately. So Brady didn't want to get to December 15th. The Supreme Court says, you know what, we're not here in this case. The suspension then goes into effect, and this is the last two regular season games and the first two playoff games. Or if it happens with a week to go in the season, he'd miss the last regular season game and the next and the first three playoff games if they got that far. Or if it happened on January 5th, he would have missed the entire playoffs. So he took what amounted to the sure thing, which is missing the first four games, rather than gamble that he would miss anything in January. And that's why I wrote the other day that the ultimate revenge he can get on Goodell now because he's going to be sitting out the four games for something that in his mind and in his heart he believes he didn't do, the revenge he gets on him is making Goodell hand him that Super Bowl MVP trophy in Houston in February. And we've seen those Brady teams before start out 2-2 two and two more than right, once right. and still get to the Super Bowl and win it. Uh, but still, when you take a look back at this whole Deflategate thing, and this thing could have been settled a long time ago, and I, I, and, and, I, and I don't believe Brady should be sitting out four games, but I also don't believe he went about everything the right way. And Roger Goodell clearly, uh, it, to me, didn't go about everything the right way. But I just don't get how anyone could justify to me why Tom Brady should be sitting out four games for – a ruling in the Wells report that was more probable than not. I just don't get it, Gary. I think it's silly. Well, I felt this way from the very, very beginning. And um, I think the way the NFL should have handled it, uh, as soon as this information came out, was just hand me the Patriots a fine, make it significant if you want. Um, the NFL never considered that possibly the balls lost air pressure because of the cold weather. I know living in the Northeast, and you live here too, Zach, you come out to your car in the morning, you park it outside in December after it's been 15 degrees overnight, the tire light comes on, and, you know, pressure has left your tire or escaped from your tire, and the same principle applies to football. So I'm not saying that's what happened, but the NFL totally discounted the possibility that that's what caused the, uh, the football to deflate. They, they admitted in court they never had any concrete evidence linking Brady to this. And um, I just think the NFL got themselves in so deep on this and, and backed themselves in the corner. And to some degree, I think it was payback for the light penalty they handed, Goodell handed out to Spygate. And, and this time they just were going to go to the other extreme in punishing Brady. And um, I, I just think it was wrong and um, – at some point, somewhere along the way, there should have been some kind of meeting of the minds on this <clears throat> where they reached a compromise that it never would have had to go this far. Last one for you, Gary, since you're an authoritative voice on all things when it comes to football. I know you're uh, very big with the Hall of Fame, and, and I just want to mm -hmm. ask you this because um, I, I still don't understand. I'm a big fan of the game, and obviously I didn't see this guy play, but will Jerry Kramer ever get into the Hall of Fame? Because I've been advocating for a bunch of years that Jerry Kramer needs to get into the Hall of Fame. You know, it's funny. You're the uh, second person that's asked me specifically about Jerry Kramer in the last week, and, and the only thing I can really tell you is I've been on the committee for six or seven years now, and his, he was really past being a modern-era candidate, and so I never had a chance to vote on him. And we have a subcommittee that presents us with either one or two senior candidates every year for us to consider. And since I've been on the committee, Jerry, Jerry Kramer's name has never been presented. So since I've been in the room, we've never debated Jerry Kramer's credentials. And uh, I can't tell you why, when he was eligible as a modern era guy, he didn't get in. And I can't really tell you why, as a senior candidate, the committee has not um, given us a chance to discuss him. Um, and I haven't studied his career. As a result, I haven't studied his career closely enough to give you any more than, I would say, a superficial feeling that, uh, he threw one of the great blocks in NFL history, and I know he was considered one of the best guards of his era, but obviously there were some negatives that came up during the period of time 
if he was eligible as a modern candidate that prevented him from getting in. He told me two stories once about how John Hanna asked him if he was going to the Hall of Fame, and he said, John, I'm not a Hall of Famer. And Roger Goodell uh, also asked him that same question, are you going up to Cannon this weekend? And he said, uh, Roger, once again, I'm not a Hall of Famer. So if those two guys think he's a Hall of Famer, he should be a Hall of Famer in my books. But Gary Myers, excellent stuff today. We appreciate the long spot and uh, some of your time. All right, Zach, you take care now. It's a pleasure being on with you. And good luck on your show. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. There's Gary Myers from the New York Daily News. A tremendous conversation with him on all things football with the Jets, the Eagles, the Giants, and, of course, the Flake Gate and my guy, Jerry Kramer. You have to put number 64 in the Hall of Fame. It's been a long time, but Jerry needs to be in the Hall of Fame. And I'm only 21, and I'm telling you that. How am I able to tell you that at 21 and some of these guys that have been covering the game for a long time don't have an explanation why Jerry Kramer isn't in the Hall of Fame? Jerry needs to be in the Hall of Fame, and we need to do something about it. But getting back to the Jets, Ryan Fitzpatrick, come on. You had a very good year last year, 31 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, and you didn't play so hot in the final game. But you are not this stud of a quarterback. You have 154 touchdown passes on your career to 116 interceptions. You're an okay quarterback. You need to find a way to get a deal done with the Jets because if Geno Smith is the quarterback for the Jets this year, yikes, it's going to be one long season and Jet fans are just going to be saying just end the season. Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports, 920 The Jersey, 609. 919-9200 is the number. If you missed any of our conversation with Gary Myers, you could go to 920thejersey.com and we'll podcast this right after the show. One more segment to do, and we have to pay homage to Mike Piazza. He's going in the hole this weekend, and we'll play you an audio clip from Mike Piazza next. More of the Zach Gelb Show will be right back.